Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenia Miranda Verdugo, and I'm the Smart Justice Program Manager with the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Thank you for joining us for this conversation concerning the future of faculty teaching in prisons. Before we begin, and as we give folks a few minutes to hop on Zoom, I would like to share a bit of background on our foundation and describe what we have in store for you today. Founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson and Alia Michelson, the Michelson 20MM Foundation is a private nonprofit foundation organization that seeks to accelerate progress towards a more just world through grant making, programs, and impact investing. Four years ago, we launched our Smart Justice Initiative to leverage higher education as a catalytic force for transforming the lives of justice-involved individuals, while also reforming the justice system itself. We work to transform the communities impacted by our country's punitive legal system to forge brighter, more prosperous futures via education. Today, you will hear from subject matter experts who have implemented teaching practices within prisons, both in the state of California and around the country. This conversation will look at pedagogy in, in a correctional facility, building a rapport with students while maintaining mandated policies in higher education and prison programs, understanding inherent carceral environment demands on students, and using open educational resources to lower educational costs. As a note, the opinions expressed in this webinar are each participant's own perspective, which in no way represent the opinions or views of the Michelson 20MM Foundation. Before we get started, I would like to remind everyone that you will be able to ask questions via the Zoom Q&A function. We will dedicate the last portion of our webinar to answering some, if not all, of your queries. With all that said, it is my pleasure to now introduce our founder and co-chair, Dr. Gary K. Michelson, who will make a few remarks to get us started. Welcome everyone. I thank you so much for joining us today for the future of faculty teaching in prisons. While many of us are starting to settle back into some sense of normalcy, students and faculty within our prisons continue to experience the damaging repercussions of the pandemic. Most faculty members have not been allowed into the prisons in over two years, and many critical education and faculty training programs have suffered significant setbacks and fallen into disrepair. Today, we hope to jumpstart critical components of this recovery by identifying key best practices to empower our passionate faculty leading the charge. We are, of course, thrilled that Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students has been reinstated after 26 years and has precipitated this current expansion in higher education and prison programming as a national priority. By the Vera Institute's estimates, the restoration of Pell Grant eligibility for students in prison will allow half a million additional students to qualify for federal funds that have been unavailable for the last quarter century. These are 500,000 students who deserve the opportunity to succeed. However, Merely restoring Pell Grant eligibility will prove insufficient if we fail to provide the training and resources that faculty need to deliver quality in-prison programming. Recognizing this vital gap, our Michelson 20 Million Mind Foundation recently awarded a SPARK grant to faculty members at Ciro Caso Community College in order to catalyze the development of an open license faculty training and professional development program explicitly for higher education in prison programs. Ciro Caso's work has been a powerful driver in California justice reform, and they have been responsible for building and sustaining the nation's largest face-to-face -face prison college program. We are beyond proud to help scale the wisdom of this amazing community of practitioners, and I thank you all for joining us in this endeavor. Thank you, Dr. Michelson. I would also like to introduce Connecticut State Representative Josh Elliott, who will share a few remarks on this work. There we go. All right, can you hear me okay? I'm going to assume yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I am State Rep Josh Elliott out of Connecticut, representing the 88th District in Hamden. 
Uh, I'm the chairman of the Higher Education Committee. And uh, a lot of this work was brought to my attention by Dr. Aaron Corbett. And um, for me, it's uh, I couldn't be more excited to, to work with her and, uh, and Dr. Zelda Roland over at Yale because um, a lot of my work that I, I did before I became chair was in the world of criminal justice reform. Uh, my primary bill was to ensure that Connecticut became the first state to make telecommunications free for people who are incarcerated. And we're gonna go from being the most expensive state to now the first state to make these calls free. And a big part of the argument that we used when pushing um, this conversation and this legislation was this idea that we don't simply want to reduce recidivism, we wanna make sure that people are successful upon reentry. And so a lot of that was tied into this idea of keeping families in touch with each other, because then when you come back to the general public, uh, you're going to have a, a family structure or loving people uh, to come back to. And uh, I'm in a race for Secretary of State, so I weave criminal justice reform into that work by saying that everybody should have the right to vote, that if you're somebody who's paying attention uh, to the political climate and you want to uh, be part of that process, then you too are going to be more successful. And I also know that if you are somebody who's paying attention to your own education and you're using the time in a way to develop yourself personally, again, you are going to be successful when you return. And that's why higher education uh, with the criminal justice reform lens that I wear uh, is, is such, there's an incredible tie in there. And whatever we can do to ensure that resources are being uh, sent to, to people uh, that want to um, view the system through a rehabilitative lens, and I'm constantly pushing that, what are we doing to make this a more restorative process uh, in a system that was never built to be restorative and it was never built to be uh, um, rehabilitative? And uh, how can we um, dismantle that system as it is and recreate something that that ends up um, helping people and not just hurting people. So uh, I applaud you all on this work, and uh, I'm happy to be in this fight with you and uh, and and helping you in any way uh, move things through my committee uh, as as it pertains to this work. And um, I'm I am here for you. Thank you, Representative Elliott, for your insightful comments. It is now my pleasure to introduce Peter Folks and Alec Griffin from Saracoso Community College, who will be leading a presentation and a following panel discussion. Take it away, Peter and Alec. Thanks, Kenya, and uh, both the representative and um, Dr. Michelson. So faculty training is uh, near and dear to Alec and me uh, because we both our faculty, um, but we both understand deeply kind of the, the practitioner level knowledge that's needed within here. We've been working for uh, five to six years, almost full time inside of prisons um, as full time paid uh, professors for uh, Saracosa Community College. So luckily in the state of California, it, it kind of coincided at the same time where we didn't, we had a few second chance pilot um, uh, programs, but the state in 2014 issued a um, Senate Bill uh, 1391, um, which allowed our Board of Governors tuition waiver to be applied to anybody that was incarcerated, just like somebody who couldn't afford college on the outside. Um, this now applied to everybody. And so our program at our school kind of began very small, but started for the last few years has, and for the last few years has been very uh, engaged in faculty centric development, um, both with guided pathways and things like that. So um, do we have a uh, the slides that we can throw up. Awesome. So I just want to get started, center ourselves a little bit with a uh, student voice. And um, uh, this is one of my students uh, from a few semesters ago <clears throat> in his own. I just wanted to look at it. I, I could have quoted it, just put it on there, but I wanted to look at it in their own writing because um, I think it has uh, it has a bit more impact that way. But with, within this student statement here, um, I think we can begin to see that uh, the classroom environment is where this transformation happens. Um, and, and I also want to qualify when Alec and I use the word transformation, we're talking about that human's idea of what their own transformation has been. Not that we're prescribing that somebody has to become one way or the other or something like that, but that transformation um, <clears throat> from the faculty perspective should be allowed to happen within the classroom. Um, and what we provide should allow the student to, to go from A to C or A to F or A to 
Z, wherever they need to get to. Um, we're simply facilitating that process within the classroom with the content that we deliver. Uh, I, I am a faculty lead for career technical education within our program, but I'm the department chair of um, administration of justice. So we have one, one of our more successful programs are both Alec and I's associate's degree for transfer, mine's a, a, a associate's degree for transfer in administration of justice. And then Alec, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, um, Alec Griffin, I am also the prison program uh, faculty lead um, for arts and sciences. Uh, I teach anthropology and sociology and sometimes political science on, um, on and I've been on every single yard of the seven within uh, both prisons. Awesome. So can we um, advance two slides forward, please, to the first diagram? Cool. So uh, between Alec and I's discussion over the last half decade of trying to figure this work out while we're kind of being confronted with multiple issues coming on here and there, we've also found peers within there um, across the country, two of which are on the call with us. Um, and so we're going to work with uh, Dr. Andrew Beckett, uh, who's in Iowa for the Iowa um, Consortium of Higher Education and Prison, and then Dr. Aaron Corbett, um, who is at the Second Chance Education Alliance out of Connecticut. And so we're going to bring them in to this as a panel, but we've talked about with this group of four people, we've talked about a couple of these components here. And so one of the things um, that I'd like to frame the discussion with today is like a conceptual framework for when we talk about faculty training. You can have second chance, Pell, you can have an administrative component, the practitioner doing the job in the classroom. I am absolutely biased, but needs to be a primary focus of program implementation. Um, that is where things might go very well, things might go very wrong with an implementation, but it's also the space where student contact happens the most. Um, generally, people don't have, uh, within our carceral settings, they don't have open counseling offices and other things like that that you find on a campus. So the faculty member really becomes kind of like a central focus of the end all be all of your program. And so when, when framed that way, and when looked at it that way, uh, we also found um, after doing a needs assessment, both within our state and nationally, with over 180 respondents, uh, Alec and I just kind of like developed one on our own, honestly, for our program. And then we sent it out to the rest of the people. And after 180 um, respondents, we found that uh, one of the issues is there was no formalized training or very little even informal training that was taking place from the educational institution it was almost de always defaulted to a compliance-based setting. And so this, our conceptual framework is that we have three types of, you know, training and professional development and, and call us uh, semantic, you know, faculty members or whatever, but we really think that there's a, a hard slice difference between these, which is at a systems level, you generally have compliance-based training that's required. You might have PREA training, uh, legal standards, adherence to law, um, the way in which people go in and out, security requirements, that essentially to us is compliance. That's generally gonna be taken care of and or required by Department of Corrections. I hope that they have some sort of solidified process to allow anyone else inside of their facilities. They generally are gonna take care of that. If we spend our time focusing on compliance-based education um, for our teachers, we're missing out on what needs to happen inside of the classroom. And so here then we have at an organizational level, um, we have the training procedures that exist like regular old onboarding. Um, we're in California. We have 114 community colleges. There's a lot of um, competition for adjuncts or for full-time faculty. And uh, if you have a master's degree and a pulse, you might be an adjunct for us one day. Um, so that's kind of one of the things that we try to get away from within our program is that we actually have an onboarding process and it's not used very well with the rest of our school. Achieving the Dream uh, organization put out um, a tiered approach at like multiple different size, like an R1 institution R and then down the way all the way to a small community college to see that you know 90 percent of the faculty are not getting onboarding training um they put out a report for one for each of the different tiers of uh, carnegie designations so when we look at or an organizational understanding we're looking at things like training procedures within the school how do you write syllabi those kinds of things this is surprising a huge surprisingly a massive gap across the country because it's kind of like it's been in this volunteer stage where as long as we can get somebody to come in we'll, we'll figure it out on the way there's very few programs that have a formalized process of going about, at least that's what the data tells us, in addition to our own sort of uh, qualitative interactions with programs 
Uh, we have 20 schools Alec and I work with at the state because we help lead and informally lead a informal consortium um, within our state. But then we also have the individual level. And to us, this is where the professional development part came about. And we almost couldn't even access it theoretically or within our own minds. Um, we couldn't access it because we hadn't had the experience to really dive into what we needed to do in a professional development way. And so at, at this tier, we're looking at things like a specific academic freedom. There might be rules in your state, like there are in ours that faculty have purview over certain things within their classroom, um, reflective teaching practices. And uh, also we have just sort of like uh, the, the day to day of what goes on within the classroom and how we train to that. So those are the three salient categories we're going to look at today within those. We can go ahead and advance the slide forward. <clears throat> so one of these things is how can this benefit students? I love quantitative data. So uh, in my program, um, the, the area that I work within as part of the program, like one of my talents that I bring to it is that I want to look at the quantitative data. And so here's a quantitative assessment that we did over about 14,000 enrollments on main campus um, to 4,000 enrollments inside of prison over a three year period within our program, we're able to find out at the end of this that there's about a 14% higher success rate within prison um, with our education, even though it's the same faculty members that might be teaching inside as they are outside. Um, this led us to ask questions about what are we doing and where is professional development fit in this? Um, we can go ahead and advance one more. And so, what we need to look at is what happens when you engage faculty. And so leading out of that last slide that I showed you, if we can, you know, look at this area between 2016, 17 and 20, uh, 17, 18 academic years, this is within our own program, we had a massive spike um, in uh, overall unique headcount with students that also drove more teachers being involved um, and more classes being offered. And so we had to respond as a program um, and as faculty having primacy over professional development within our uh, systems uh, in California, we needed to develop something that was really a structured way to carry onboarding and then ongoing training in through this, not sending people to conferences, but really saying and becoming professionals and subject matter experts ourselves in our program to say, what do we need for our program to be effective? And then creating an evaluative measure that we can rely on year after year uh, where we're able to pull data immediately and determine its success going up, success or retention going down. Um, do, do faculty actually attend these trainings? Um, those kinds of things. These are important parts. And across the nation, we're looking at uh, programs struggling with KPIs, uh, key performance indicators for this. In our system in California, we have KPIs that are required and recidivism is not one of them, surprisingly. So the way Alec and I look at this generally is that we need to stop talking about recidivism. Um, there is a lot of academic <clears throat> um, coverage of that subject, but it doesn't affect my day to day inside the classroom because I'm not here to cut recidivism down. I'm not, I'm not a criminal justice employee anymore. I used to work in law enforcement. I'm an educator. And so I need to know what's going on in my classroom and how it's going to work. And so I think there's a more proximate measure we could use in terms of student success, uh, climate surveys, overall satisfaction of uh, employees, as well as needs assessment, which we've developed one and we can put out later. Alec, you have anything to say? Uh, I was just going to point out that um, one of the ways that we've ensured that the professional development is integrated into our whole uh, incarcerated student education program is was through uh, Peter and I hustling for a grant to be able to get release time or stipends uh, to be able to host those uh, trainings on weekends and then going after more grant money so that we could actually pay adjuncts to, to donate um, their time to, to go to these professional developments. Um, a few of them are covered within our own school system, but we also felt that there weren't enough of them. So we started to integrate more in. In fact, uh, we're gonna be hosting one for our own school on a Canvas training um, as CDCR implements um, laptops and Canvas shells inside we're going to be hosting a, a Canvas training for our um, faculty members this Saturday um, because we've been able to tap some of those grants. I was just going to kind of point to point to the need to be able to supplement people's time with compensation um, for um, ongoing professional development as um, maybe one or two days isn't enough in the year.
Yeah, absolutely. So for us, it's an ongoing process within our program. Can we uh, push the slide forward one, please? <clears throat> and so when we look at this, the training, which is that second organizational component um, when looking at the framework, the organizational component is a training response that we needed to develop. We have no solidified training for anything on our entire campus. Um, and I know that there's a lot of other schools that are maybe falling there. I think the closest we could find was probably online instructor training um, where they needed to go through like a little something first. So what we did is <clears throat> in working with our local unions, um, and this is gonna be a very fast, uh, fast forwarded survey of the different areas of professional knowledge that are, is needed to encompass uh, faculty training is we worked with like our uh, developing an MOU with um, our union that required four hours of training. Uh, when, when that was completed, we then said, hey, we'll make the four hours of training instead of relying on the union to do it, which was very, um, watch out, you're gonna die, you might get stabbed, don't say this word, that kind of thing. Um, we, after working in the facilities, felt like the training had, it was only a replication of Department of Corrections training. Um, and so we felt as though we needed real teacher training to go in there. Um, and it's now kind of become the primary type of onboarding at our school because we can also use grant funding that we wrote to pay teachers to come to it. Um, and we run more ongoing training for our prison program than any other topic within our school. Um, so our prison faculty, 57 of them right now that currently go inside that are paid employees of our school that go inside to work. Um, and teach about 100 to 115 course sections per semester there. Um, they go through this training all, all over and over and over again. So one of those things was first we needed to develop a governance structure. <clears throat> so we have a we have a standing participatory governance structure within all California community colleges. Um, part of that representation is through the Academic Senate of California Community Colleges, which is not a union, but it is a professional uh, kind of responsibility organization that is legislatively designated to handle um, issues within our college that then administrators are meant to administer, for instance, curriculum. We have primacy on that and develop that programs, um, hiring recommendations, as well as professional development. So we felt that this fit right in there. We read the policy landscape. We created a resolution that formed a committee that had a primary goal of getting people trained and establishing a standard at our own campus. And that developed and blossomed into understanding and creating guided pathways. So we now have seven uh, degree pathways, um, transferable degree pathways. This last semester, we graduated 100, or last year, we graduated 167 um, associate's degree for transfer folks from inside of our prison program. The year before that was 93, and this current year is going to be somewhere around 199. It amounts to about 40% of our entire school's degree, uh, awarded degrees um, for our community college now come out of prison because we have a very engaged and knowledgeable faculty base, even our adjuncts, um, we treat them as we would with full-timers. Part of that is them understanding everything and then looking at it from the student perspective, right? Because we are in there and we're interacting with it. Alec, do you want to talk about the PTK component about like how that informs us? Yeah, sure. So a, a very large percentage of our students, because Peter alluded to their, their success rates, um, qualified for Phi Theta Kappa, the Honor Society. Um, and we have a very engaged student population um, on a specific yard at Tehachapi in particular. I think we have over a hundred PTK members um, that are just constantly trying to engage in helping the college, but also engage in helping to change the dynamics of the prison yard um, with, with um, projects, with uh, citizenry, um, give back kind of um, donation drives and all of these other different things. Um, PTK to a large degree has also become our, our tutoring structure, which is on that yard. It's our largest yard in terms of student population. Um, and they're, they're helping to inform us because they bring up a lot of uh, the positives and negatives of our program um, in meetings and how to make them better and how they can help. And so there's this integral student relationship with um, not only the college and helping us out, but also the, the cultural dynamic that they bring to the yard itself. Um, they've become kind of the cool gang on the yard where, mem where um, incarcerated folk who are not even part of the college are asking to do projects with Phi Theta Kappa. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm the, um, 
I guess the the advisor for for these groups. Um, the yards have changed a lot during COVID, but I was able to meet with them uh, last semester when we were able to go in with kind of limited time. Um, and they're engaged in right now recycling projects and some of these other things that are going on. Just astounding at not only their work ethic, but the vision um, they're putting together right now. Um, your, uh, prison wide uh, newspaper structure and also podcasts too. So they're, they are highly motivated and act as kind of like the college's arm and or care structure inside of the, the prison yard. Hopefully that, that alluded to what you were, you were getting after Peter. Yeah, I think so. I just lobbed that one over to you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, P PTK is a national honor society. It has about 1,500 different opportunities for scholarships when students get out. And 25% of our 1,300 students, they, they qualify for PTK. They take it very seriously. We have aligned our PTK chapter inside of our seven prison yards with our main campus chapter. So those students have come in um, there too. So it's a way for us to have an ongoing pulse you know, a qualitative pulse on like, how's the things going with the program? Where can we change? Where can we do this stuff? And with Alec being an advisor, then we, he and I can talk about this and then we can guide and implement new training. So it's kind of like where our roles fit into this program. And then this was all working uh, in the background as we came up to this thing and we got an opportunity to write a catalyst grant for an OER faculty training handbook, um, which Alec and I have finished. It's like a hundred pages of content um, and it's and it's kind of it's maybe more like a train the trainer type of document that's going to be open resource um, that Michelson has uh, helped us with, as well as uh, adding um, a uh, training component, which is through an event that we're going to be running uh, in June for faculty and program uh, managers or whatever else uh, that some of the other people on this call are also going to attend. So we'll get to that in a little bit. Can we forward the slide? Understanding and using um, understanding and using OER to our advantage allowed us to come to scale. It was impossible to afford textbooks, so we needed to go through and teach and train our faculty of how to adopt OERs. Let's come to consensus on, um, and we say teach and train, but honestly, it's a lot of this is Alec and I being consensus builders. Okay, what's a great way to serve students? Let's implement OERs. And so when we implemented OERs, we went from like 20 core sections to 85 within one year inside the prison because now we could actually have the classes being offered. We had teachers that pick and chose and curated groups of OER materials and textbooks um, so that they could be delivered. We then had to get them printed. Uh, I've had to drive a U-Haul into our prison, like a, a 25 foot, 30 foot U-Haul into our prison with thousands and thousands of pounds of books. Um, I just did that at the start of this semester. Um, and that kind of stuff uh, comes out of the training component. Then we move into, okay, this is challenging us to pick the right textbooks. There's no more hand-me-down syllabi going on. There's no more hand-me-down textbooks uh, within the program. So as we teach and train people within what our organizational structure is gonna be like, let's look at the next side, which is professional development isn't just, I'm gonna train you to do this thing. Really, it's a comprehensive approach to understanding and responding to what our faculty need most. And so for us, that fell into the category of trauma-informed practices. Uh, we then worked within our state informal system um, and uh, we're part of a community of practice that brought in NYU's McSilver Institute of Research. Part of that, like all these things have been interlinked and it sounds like a lot because it is. Um, honestly, the, the most substantial part of our program that's been able to produce these types of desired outcomes across the country, uh, both in terms of amount of students served, the full-time equivalent um, metric, as well as uh, graduations and success in transferring people to a variety of four-year institutions in our state um, one of those things has been faculty taking a primary role within the program because Pell might pay for administrative support, but how are you going to engage your faculty to actually do stuff beyond just teaching the classroom? And so for us, that's been a core component. Um, like Alex said, uh, you know, the cool gang on the yard is, is college. At our school, um, the Tehachapi crew <laughs> is a problem. When we show up in the parking lot um, with four people and, and hop out at graduation, like, uh oh, Tehachapi crew's here, uh, because they know that we work differently. We work as a community of practice with our instructors, um, and we have time and we actually prioritize that type of work. So, Alec and I are, are doers. We love theory. Um, but we like implementation and praxis more. We're actually putting it to work. And so that's one of those components. So in doing that, this came up where it was like, hey, there's an opportunity to do a community of practice event, but no, no one's willing to run an event. 
So we went through and were able to snag some grant money in 2019 within our college. And we put on an event. <clears throat> we can advance the slide. And we put on an event um, that we call Base Camp. Um, and so Base Camp is run as a retreat for faculty and program educators um, uh, uh, around prison, but also includes every carceral environment like jail or community corrections. And um, we had about 92 people come. And then the pandemic hit that next spring. Um, we're actually running another one though in June, um, this June, June 8th to the 12th, um, right here, join us in the community. This is a, um, a uh, I sent a link, Kenya, I'm so sorry, or Jen, I had sent a link. Can we drop that in the chat maybe? So the ability to register for this event is now open. It's June 8th to the 12th. Um, it's fully all inclusive for faculty, uh, including like food, housing, um, everything to come together, gain consensus. And what we wanted to do, this was a statewide opportunity we had in 2019. We want to do this now nationally. Um, and Michelson has helped catalyze this work so quickly um, because within the program that we were writing this train, the trainer handbook, um, we also wrote out this agenda and did this kind of stuff. We had to go on pause because of the pandemic, but now we're ready. Um, we're ready to run it. We've got facilitators, one of which is Dr. Aaron Corbett, who's coming up here soon on our panel. And um, we want to extend a, a heartfelt and heartwarming welcome to anybody in this country who is going in to the facilities that needs support and needs a community of practice, we want to build that with you. Um, we're gonna do co-production of research, um, ethnographies. Um, we have like actual guided wellness sessions, not just like a room off to the side where you can go be quiet, but we have guided meditation, yoga. Um, it's in an outdoor environment um, in response to COVID too, um, where it's gonna be very safe uh, in that respect. But then also it, our connection with nature allows us to sort of disengage from the bars and the and the razor wire and the concrete walls and things like that. And we can associate a little bit better about who we are because we think professional development falls back on me as a professional and within there, I am a human, right? So I need to have some personal development that coincides and parallels my professional development. And really over the last few years, um, I've started to talk like this uh, and Alec has noted that this is very different seven years ago, I was hopping fences, chasing people as a police officer. Um, now I'm doing this work. It is, it is absolutely transformed my life. My interaction with my students has transformed my life. Um, and, and this type of stuff is where we see the need in such an intense and toxic environment of incarceration. Uh, we see that this is needed. So what we're going to do is open up the panel now, and we're going to talk about what this looks like across the U.S. We have Connecticut on the East Coast. We have Iowa in the Central uh, like central part of the U.S., Midwest, um, and then we have uh, California, us, um, and so what it looks like for us in our program is what we'd like to do is we've had the opportunity to really develop scale and scale out different types of programs and trainings, and we'd like to offer that as open resources as possible to people to be able to interact and do what they need to do and get it done there, and we want to be your support mechanism when you need data when you need qualitative information about why this is important, we want to support all the rest of the people on this call across the country with that. I think that's an ultimate goal of why we even did this call was to let you know you're not alone. We're here to support you. And um, we've been able to be working in a very structural way now, an implementation way that now we're into full adoption. Um, so that Catalyst grant that we got with Michelson led into an Andrew Mellon grant with the state of California and the um, Academic Senate of California Community Colleges. So now there's 12 faculty, two of which are Alec and I. Um, Alec and I both also sit on the steering committee for the state for new policies, uh, adjusting penal codes, um, rewriting, guiding principles, things like that within this type of work, and working directly with our Department of Corrections um, uh, partners um, who have been great with us. But also this new Andrew Mellon grant is a multi-year grant to establish a structure within our state that will address all 20 colleges that work inside of the prisons, um, 400 so faculty that are currently employed to do that, um, you know, on a rotating basis, and to create a structure uh, and institutionalize, but I want to use that word very, like, loosely, a way in which we know we're doing what needs to be done for our faculty, and so that's developing a standing committee just to address faculty concerns, components, regional events over and over again. What we'd like to do is honestly have this become a model, but that small little catalyst grant that, that Michelson worked with us on um, that seemed like a long shot when we applied a few years ago has now blossomed into what is a structural component. Um, we also have a $10 million yearly line item uh, categorical funding for colleges in California now 
through our work on the steering committee that is now going to be pay paying to support uh, faculty professional development in this space um, on an ongoing basis. And so structuring that is there. So we would like to have you join us for this event so that we can then talk through how we can make these things work here and there. And six years ago, when I got hired as a faculty member coming from being a cop, I never would have thought that I could have been sitting at a steering committee uh, for a state. And so um, it's really hard. Um, and I know I see a comment about like, yeah, I know that my state's uh, like this. We understand that. And so part of that is where do you address burnout? Do you address burnout because you're trying to you're trying to struggle with systems level issues that can't be solved when you could be working more locally or addressing local issues, which is what we were doing is like, what the heck does this keep happening? Why does this keep happening? We need to go to the systems level and we need to start knocking on doors, hearts and minds campaigns, all those kinds of things. Um, so anyways, let's uh, open up the panel. Uh, we'll put more information about that. Kenya, are we good to just keep rolling? Yeah, we can just go ahead and introduce the panel and sure. start the discussion. Let's start with uh, Dr. Corbett. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon and good morning to folks wherever you may be as you're tuning in. My name is Erin Corbett. I am the CEO and co-founder of the Second Chance Educational Alliance here in Connecticut. I am also the director of the Quinnipiac University Prison Project, which is also here in Connecticut. Um, I, in addition to that, <laughs> those two jobs, um, I do a little bit of external evaluation um, on some state level projects with Minnesota and Iowa, so I know Dr. Beckett very well. Um, I am a part of the executive team of the Jami Sisterhood, um, and I have two dogs who you may hear in the background at any given moment. <laughs> awesome, thanks. How about you, Dr. Beckett? Hello, Andrew Beckett. Um, I am definitely the novice of the panelists of the group and probably come at this a little bit different. Um, been very, relying very heavily on uh, Alec and um, Peter and Aaron's expertise over the last few years. Um, I'm the Associate Dean uh, at University College at the University of Iowa. And uh, my, my normal portfolio, if you will, uh, is I oversee a lot of the first year experience programs and supplemental support. Um, tutoring for um, our traditional aged residential students. But four years ago, I was asked to um, assist some faculty in uh, creating a college and prison program. We oversee the two online degree programs. University College was the uh, most obvious fit for that. And so I began that work about four years ago. Uh, most recently, um, the last year, uh, I was University of Iowa, Grinnell College joined a consortium with five community colleges um, in the state of Iowa who are doing this work. And uh, we've just actually celebrated our, our one year anniversary, if you will, of, of being a consortium. So um, learning as we go, I can probably provide a lot of insight on what not to do, um, but I'm happy to, to be a part of this uh, discussion this afternoon. Awesome, thank you. So I, I'm gonna throw out the first question here, which is that all three of us, uh, like all three of the areas that we represent across the country have a different way of having gone about this. And um, like Andrew, you just said, uh, kind of developing a consortium first. Um, for us, we're still, it, it took a long time for us to actually develop a consortium. Um, we had to pick up uh, the phone and call people and say, hey, can we get space on your agenda? Um, you don't know who we are, you've never met us. Alec and I were both untenured at the time. Um, and so we were, we started hesitant and then we got really bold <laughs> and we started going around and, and kind of calling people out and saying like, hey, we really need this to be working this way, but it's not, what do we need to do? And they say, well, nobody's doing it. And so we just insert ourselves in the process. So maybe could you just give, um, we'll start with you, Andrew, and then we'll go to, back to Aaron about just like, why was the idea uh, specifically around like faculty uh, training or something like that? Uh, constructed first, or how did you come about that process? Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, I think when we first got started, it, it certainly was a, a co coalition of the willing, if you will, those who were very interested in this work. We got started actually because faculty were um, essentially re reading, uh, volunteering and, and leading a, a book group, if you will, um, at a, um, a prison that's located five miles from the University of Iowa's main campus. Um, the university actually already has a relationship with it, it's uh, some of their, the, um, they rely very heavily on the University of Iowa health uh, system uh, for medical needs for incarcerated individuals. So some of the relationships between the university and the, and the prison were already there, 
But um, in, terms, in terms of the faculty support, there were people who, who wanted to go in and they had been leading a book group and they said, well, why can't we um, then, you know, turn this into a classroom? There's a lot of differences between reading, a, doing a weekly book group with rotating faculty members coming in and not having that ongoing engagement and actually uh, running classes, right? So, um, you know, some of the things that, uh, that our faculty noticed initially is when you're teaching students on campus, um, they tend to come in for 50 minutes, three times a week, and they have some discussion and they leave. And the next week they come in and they're not bringing their experiences back to the classroom, right? They're talking about calculus. They're talking about uh, whatever the subject matter is. When you're teaching in prison, uh, life goes on after the faculty leave. And when they're teaching, when, the, when they come back into the, the, the prison the next week, uh, students will come, will obviously bring up what is going on. And so that takes a lot of ongoing development with faculty about how to maneuver that. Um, it's a strength, right? It, because it's also changed the dynamics that in an ideal situation, you've got students who are, who are engaging in coursework um, with each other every single day because they're living together. But knowing how to navigate that is not something that uh, you necessarily um, have a lot of expertise with. And you certainly do not want inexperienced faculty or graduate students doing. And that was one of our er early mistakes, if you will, is just, uh, I think Alex said, you know, any, anybody who has an adjunct in, in structure, come on in, we'll, we'll take you. Um, and so a lot of the things we tried to do was just kind of build a faculty um, uh, development kind of group learning community, if you will, where we just gave folks who are teaching an opportunity uh, on a weekly basis to, to dialogue and talk about what are some of the issues and how can we help there's a lot of other issues that we dealt with that are more technical, like how do you do dual authentication, trying to log in uh, behind bars when you don't have a cell phone, those types of things, which um, those, those are very, I, I think that's what's used to the system level uh, of, of how you address that and can certainly talk about that later, but I'll, I'll let uh, Aaron jump in. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that insight, Andrew. Um... So I come to the, the faculty training space very much uh, from two distinct places. One is kind of a, a broad conceptual framework about instructional practice and praxis and what that means for the students that we're working with. The other is um, my aunt who is from and lives in Brooklyn, um, has two master's degrees and taught special ed in Brooklyn um, for over 25 years before she retired. And so education is very much a part of kind of my DNA, was part of my upbringing. And while I um, wailed against it in high school saying that I would literally never be a teacher because students are terrible, here we are, <laughs> you know, there but for the grace of God. So, um, so when I think about like teaching as a praxis, there as a praxis and a practice, there is a lot of kind of reading and learning that goes into what I do and how I arrive in the classroom. Part of what I think is missing a lot of times in faculty training programs is the necessary consideration of how we arrive to the classroom as instructors and how students arrive to the classroom as students. I think we take a lot for granted, especially if there are those of us who are teaching on campus and inside um, prisons. I think there's a lot that we take for granted in terms of how our free world students show up ready to learn. And we try to map that onto our students inside and assume that that is also how they show up ready to learn when that is not in fact the case. So there's a, you know, there's a ton of theories about you know, sort of what happens inside of prisons, how the culture is replicated and duplicated and perpetuated. But there is this theory of prisonization um, that you know, folks who are incarcerated, especially folks who are incarcerated for a long time, there is almost an internalization in many instances of the culture that is perpetuated within the particular institution. That level of institutionalization often, not always, um, includes um, pieces like lack of trust um, in authority figures, lack of um, desire to be open or vulnerable and communicate in ways that are kind of transparent. And we, we expect that that is actually, so, so being open and being vulnerable and understanding kind of the learning space um, as what it is, we, we assume 
and expect our free world students to show up in that way, ready to participate. And in doing so with our inside students, we ignore that there might be other things at play that are impacting how they are showing up to the classroom to take part in the class. And so I think the first part that, that I try to communicate to people who are going inside for the first time is to literally like take a, a couple of pauses, a couple of breaths to have this conversation about what they are bringing to the classroom and what they think the students inside are bringing to the classroom. Because it's from that starting point that we can start to break down what are the conceptions that people have you know, about our students, but what are also the conceptions that people have about themselves? <laughs> there are lots of people who think they are wonderful instructors, who think that they are just the greatest thing to instructional practice, and they're actually trash. And so it allows us, you know, the, the kind of flexibility to have the conversation where you can tell someone they're trash, but you can also say, here are the ways that you can be better for yourself and also for, for your students. The other piece that um, has been really exciting, but then COVID you know, just made it garbage because that's what COVID does. Um, in Second Chance, we had crafted a process and I use we very deliberately, we had crafted a process for faculty vetting. So before even like getting to the point where we're training faculty about you know, what to do in the classroom, how to you know, enter the classroom ready to teach, we came up with this process of how to get students involved in the faculty vetting process. And so we came up with this, uh, again, with this, um, with this process, I feel like I've said that 15 times, so forgive me for that, um, where people you know, would send in their resumes, their CVs, et cetera. We would have a couple of um, released students, so former students of ours, look at the credentials of the person who wanted to teach. If they felt that those credentials you know, were sufficient, we would ask that person to come in for a first round interview. So they would meet with those students. The students would lead that interview process. Um, sometimes I didn't even have to be, be there, um, which was even greater because I think it um, provides students uh, more of that autonomy and just kind of ownership of the process. And so they would talk to the person, ask the questions, the candidate would be able to ask questions of the students. And then after that was over, the students would let us know if they wanted that person to proceed to the next step. If they did, the person then observed a class inside and they would, you know, observe a class that was taught by a phenomenal teacher. So obviously it was my class um, or, you know, maybe someone else if I wasn't teaching on a particular night. Um, but they would observe the class, again, observe the dynamic of the students, also observe the dynamic of the facility. Um, because if you haven't been in a prison before and you're sort of walking into a maximum security facility for the first time, it can be very daunting. It can be very very like just oppressive on your spirit. And so this visit was also designed to just kind of get folks oriented to the atmosphere inside the facility. They would observe the class. And then at the end of the class, the students, the current students would have the opportunity to ask questions of the candidate as well. Once the candidate left, the students would decide if they wanted to have them come in for, um, for a, not a mock lesson, but just like a mini lesson to get a sense of their teaching style, et cetera, see if they had absorbed any of the information that they had gotten from these many steps. Um, and so the teacher would come in, our classes are 90 minutes, so they would teach for 45 minutes, and then the last 45 minutes would be in real-time feedback from the current students. And then these students decided if a person would be brought on board. So this is very much an inclusive, collaborative process because our students are our partners. Um, certainly there are, you know, there's content that we are trying to make sure students learn. Obviously we wanna make sure if they're doing things for credit, we get the, the seat time and all of, all of that stuff, all the compliance stuff for higher ed, we wanna make sure that's happening. But we also wanna be very, very clear with our students that they are our partners in this venture. And, this process really think, I, I really think that it helped to make that really just more palpable, more powerful, more, uh, more authentic feeling of inclusion and ownership of the program. So once someone, you know, just kind of got through that process, 
then they met with me. <laughs> and so we, um, at Second Chance, we do not um, have a line item in our state budget. We do not have a staff. I am the staff. And so the trainings that would happen with faculty would be led by myself. Um, at the time before COVID, um, I was working with uh, the University of Connecticut to have some teaching assistance, um, as well as Eastern Connecticut State University. And we would run the train the the faculty trainings um, very much like what Peter was talking about in terms of the professional development opportunities that that they have created. And it was also an opportunity for our TAs, some of whom I worked with for all four years of their time in undergrad. Um, again, prior to the world shutting down. And so it was really great to have them as kind of the next generation of folks who are going to be in this work, so much so that there was one TA that we had um, who went on to get her PhD and is trying to start a second chance chapter in that state. So when you equip people with the knowledge, the understanding, the broad like conceptual frameworks of what we do, they are far better able to understand how they themselves are situated within the context of this field, as well as where our students are situated and they're better positioned to serve them well so that our students are having the best educational opportunities that they can. I hope that answers the question. Oh, yeah, I, I think more than enough answers the question. Maybe we should just call it coffee time. Um, Awesome. Thank you so much. So I want to work kind of back in reverse because you mentioned a couple of things there and I want to ask Andrew and then I want to go back to Alec and see. So what other type of evaluative measures are, is your program considering for faculty? Like do you have, do you have structured evaluations like Aaron was just talking about? Students like might vet somebody. Is there a hiring process? That kind of thing. So Andrew, what does that look like for, for within the iChip consortium? So we had a lot of observation by we by our director uh, at the time. We've, we've actually not been teaching out for the last um, two years uh, in person um, for, for obviously reasons, but um, a lot of it was just because of the size, the size was pretty small. We, we had someone obviously um, uh, who was a director who would, who would observe um, the, the classes. I think what we ended up doing a, was very helpful was just having dialogue with students um, after the fact in, in um, informal focus groups, if you will, not only about the instruction, but what they wanted, because we, we've started with three courses and uh, we quickly, you know, tripled that number per semester of course offerings. Um, so I think also just trying to trying to engage with students about what are you interested in learning. At the time we were looking at, we, this was a non-degree seeking um, program, but we were also looking for courses that would, um, uh, certainly, you know, transfer to another institution um, to to um, obtain a, an associate's degree. We actually engaged in a partnership with um, Iowa Central Community College in Iowa, which was a second chance Pell site. Um, they were doing online courses, and we were trying to supplement them with in-person courses that um, to assist with that. So uh, it was a very um, you know subjective process at the time. I think that that's what, what the um, ICHEP right now, our consortium is trying to do is really lay a foundation for what that looks like. We're trying to create some uh, professional development standards across the board for all the higher education and prison um, colleges um, that will also include some metrics of, of what success looks like um, as we move forward. Awesome. And then Alec, I'm going to kick it to you. Um, maybe do you want to just cover sort of like, uh, without us, can you talk about the note and then um, the evaluation process, like how we've inserted insurgency and stuff like that to some degree, and to create a structure around it. The note you're talking about, the "You Are Beautiful" note, but no, yeah. no. Um, a lot of a lot of the impetus to to Peter and I's um, gusto, we'll say, to uh, implement some of this professional development and ensure that the program has legs to stand on and is is integrated into the college was um one of our instructors in my first semester probably in the first month or two that i was in the prison one of our female instructors was was i think passed out I, it was either a note or it was it was written on a test but it said you are beautiful and this instructor went on a witch hunt essentially trying to figure out whose handwriting it was along with the educational coordinator inside uh the prison um Essentially, when we found this out, Peter and I, we were working at the same time with this individual. Uh, we 
drove over to a bar and, and discussed this over brews and burgers and essentially came up with the idea that if we didn't somehow solve this structural problem, we may both be out of a job. So a little bit of self-preservation, but also the fact that we believed in the product, we believed in, in, in education inside and whatnot, and essentially came up with various tactics. Um, we've kind of called them the policy insurgency model, which was how do we integrate ourselves into the school so much that they can't just shut down the program based on a note or based on hearsay or based on um, one person's whim. So essentially right after that, Peter and I um, reached out to some people within the community college structure and they um, kind of advised us and helped us out to work through our local academic senate to produce a resolution. Um, that resolution we created um, was the formation of the incarcerated student education program um, sanctioned by and signed off by the academic senate. They resolved and they were okay with it because basically nobody but Peter and I and a few others were even involved in the program. So the main campus okayed the resolution, we integrated in, and at that point it started to become kind of the cool group and the, the school president wanted it integrated into the college council. So that integration allowed us to have stability, but also start to form the structure of the program, which included faculty training and development. Um, because Peter and I also figured out that we could easily have squashed that issue through a front loading of professional development, right? Like something like that does not need to create a witch hunt, right? It just simply needs a class conversation of like, hey, we're all in college here and this is not what we do to college instructors. And if you want us all to keep coming back, you can't do it, right? It's a simple thing. And then say, now I'm done being mom or dad, right? And move on and be college instructors. Um, but that informed a lot of our, a lot of, I would say a lot of fires in the beginning, at least when I was starting, informed a lot of the impetus to, um, I don't know, institutions, probably the wrong word, but, but at least creating that, that infrastructure that was immovable, that they could not pull away or get rid of. And, and that structure itself created an evaluative program measure uh, because it was part of that that committee process of of programmatic evaluation so it was like instantly integrated in yeah and so kind of uh, sorry to kind of diverge from the whole panel thing but uh so what that did is it structured a way so now if there's a full-time hire that's going to happen that might teach inside the prison someone from the icep from from our incarcerated student education committee they sit on that hiring committee uh, and then we also needed to ensure through our union and stuff, we needed to ensure that we were doing our course evaluations because they were not happening uh, to start with. And so we actually went back and advocated that, no, 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 we need to do this. And you chairs need to either come inside the prison or designate someone, which we found within our policy, uh, they were able to have or designate to do an evaluation. Um, and so we were able to get that tasked out to people so that we can also do that. So we have, we had a, we had a merge a structure with, sort of what was a wild west approach to like us just kind of doing everything we needed to do um and we felt as though we really needed to solidify that as we move on so whereas some people have started thinking across the country here the different people that might be on the call whereas some people have started with a more structural approach we started with a, an approach that was totally in the dark uh our admin had no idea what was going on on a daily basis there might be conversations like don't you dare tell the vice president what happened today um and then we eventually found a way to manage how we could do that deliver that kind of like hey uh by the way like i got gassed when i was on uh when I was teaching a midterm. And so that, that happened. We don't want that to scare off other people, but how do we manage these kinds of things moving on and into the future and stuff? And so when we look at it that way, this is just an area, and, and I don't want to call it out so uniquely that um, it becomes so much of its own thing. One thing that I think we agree on this panel across the board is like, all, of, all this situation, this environment of the carceral classroom does, is it projects a lot more of the things that maybe individual students might struggle with on a main campus, and it becomes just very in our face, and it really challenges us to try and find solutions to, to these types of things. Um, and so I want to hit a couple questions from the Q&A. Um, we, we have got somebody from Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Hello. And yes, please come out to the event. And um, a lot of this, uh, we think... Uh, 
why we wanted to have a conversation that was more national instead of uh, state or region centric was, um, or now international, I guess, is that we think that these concepts of at least attending to the fact that faculty need this um, should be uh, applied on a large scale. We just encourage you to, to do everything you can to structuralize it in a way um, that it can be there. We had some people with uh, what we've you know deemed, other people have deemed savior complex that we needed to really address and, and to, to be honest, root out of the program. Um, they were gonna cause, they were already causing damage to students, they were causing damage to the program. How do we do that if we can't hold a, a, a peer accountable and saying like, hey, we all talked about this and came to a consensus on this ethical framework. And so that's what happens within our training materials. It's like, here's, here's an issue. If you're visiting on Saturdays, not during class time, people in their housing units, because you're a teacher, and you're not doing normal visiting and you're delivering materials to guys in their boxer briefs while they're on, in their cells, that is what we would call not a professional way of going about delivering material. There's routes to do that. If that's something that absolutely has to happen, you need to make contact with the program manager, that kind of thing. So we needed to create some structure in these areas so that we can do that. Within that though, there's always a conversation of academic freedom, right? Like where does academic freedom fall? Uh, somebody from the Illinois um, Consortium for Higher Education at Prison, uh, Mr. Wade, uh, he published an article in 2021 about um, censorship uh, within the Department of Corrections. So I'm sorry, I'm going to come back across that. So Alec, do you want to talk about how we address censorship from an academic freedom perspective um, in terms of training? And then I'll bounce to the other attendees or panelists. Yeah, we have we have decent support, I would say, within CDCR, at least in the educational programs um, from custody is a little bit spotty. Um, but you know, training that is is difficult. Uh, I kind of simplify it and say, you know, um, if what you're talking about is going to kick you, get you kicked out of the prison and end our program, is it worth talking about it? Right? I mean, there, there has to be some level of, of insurance that yes, you have freedom to talk about things. Um, but are, how are they going to sound when somebody gets this, the, the flash bite, right? Um, I, in fact, in anthropology, we cover sex, gender, and sexuality. In archaeology, if you talk about the moche, they're, they're very, all of their art is sexual. And essentially, um, you know, there are things that I will, I, I, I will maybe skip over. And I would say, are they necessary for my course content if that custody official is walking by in that moment? Um, some things might be, it might be worth a risk. I would also, I also advocate that you need to build rapport with your custody officers. Once you have rapport with custody officers, they don't even listen to you anymore, right? They don't, they're not even aware of what you're talking about because you're just a mainstay at that place in their space. So, you know, those things, we can say those things. Training, it's probably a little bit harder because I think that some, some faculty that go inside might get a little bit more encouraged to fly off the handle and say things they shouldn't. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we haven't had those faculty. We have. Um, but I would also argue that 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 training training is ongoing. It's constant. And if we we if we encourage our instructors to be reflective, that's the key component. That's the key component. Awesome. How about um, let's go to Andrew. Uh, you know, is there a centralized disallowed materials list that you need to navigate? Are you doing things like that? Like, how, no, that's another you one. You learn, things the, you learn things the hard way. Uh, so we had done a couple of semesters when um, one of our rhetoric instructors was just planning to use the same text that she used on campus, and the book had a swastika on it. That got that got axed. Like, that was a no-no, and we could not use that text. So I think what Alex was saying is building that rapport and... Um, you know, realizing that this is not the same setting as teaching on campus, and so that you know, there's a little give and take to it. Um, I think another big issue is like when, do, when, what happens when you're teaching like a rhetoric course and um, things are revealed in a paper. Like, so how do you respond to those types of things? So um, I think you know, we certainly want to give provide the same edu educational opportunities inside as we do outside, but it is a different environment and a different setting, and so. Um, and there, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Academic freedom goes so far off on campuses too, right? There, there, we've all seen, you just pick up uh, the Chronicle and you will see examples of something where, you know, something, so there are parameters that, that we have to work in. Awesome, Aaron, last, I'll give you the last little bit. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, so in Connecticut, there is like a mystery text list of banned books um, that we are never allowed to see that apparently changes every semester. Um, and so what I have done and what I encourage my instructors to do is to find more obscure texts um, that may not, you know, have the words race, crime, and justice, right, on the, on the front cover. It's something that's more along the lines of like carceral logic and, <laughs> and society, right? Because people like to see more general and vague things. And um, I generally um, try to, I try to and try to encourage uh, uh, the, the staff, faculty, to um, just really dig in, you know, back in their old syllabi, like what were some of the texts that really spoke to you that aren't necessarily mainstream, but that can still talk to students about the human condition, that can still talk to students about how we talk about and view history and how we are living history in our bodies every day. And so I think there has to be a certain level of creativity and innovation when it comes to the materials that are provided, um, because we don't wanna shortchange students who are inside just because DOCs may believe that they're not capable of having you know, controversial conversations without it escalating to violence. Um, and so that's been, you know, a method that's been really um, effective. We have not had any books turned away. Um, and so, you know, I'm just going to keep on going. <laughs> awesome. So I think that kind of uh, begins to wrap us up. You can tell there's a lot to this conversation uh, that needs to keep going. Honestly, that's why we decided to do a four day, five day intensive on it. Aaron's going to be there um, to help facilitate some stuff. Um, I don't know if Andrew's going to make it, but somebody from iChep is going to be there as well. And then Alec and I will be there um, pretty much taking out the trash. Uh, not Aaron's trash, though. Um, but uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be serving our fellow faculty members by helping cook and sourcing farm to table food and things like that. So we really want everyone to come um, that can, honestly, and anybody that's involved in kind of like the carceral education setting. Um, it, this is an event for you. Um, but... Outside of that, I really do want to thank Michael Sim for giving us a platform to be able to discuss what we see um, from faculty across the board, as you can tell from us four on this panel. What we can see is that there's going to be a gap that forms between where the funding comes from and then the, the practitioner level application and implementation. And we want it all to succeed. And so we just ask you to really think about um, where do faculty fit in your program? And if you are faculty, how, are, how well are you represented within that program? So. Uh, Ryan, do I need to send it to you for any close out, closing thoughts, anything like that? Uh, all of us are available. Um, I think our email is going to get dropped in there, um, but you can email Alec and I anytime. Um, or uh, I don't want to speak for Aaron or Andrew, but I'm sure if, if you have questions, um, we're actually going to be out uh, two weeks with Andrew uh, at their iChep thing, working on professional development and stuff. So it's going to be a great time uh, also. Uh, and we just continue to learn and develop. And if we don't close ourselves off to that process, we feel as though it's changing teaching, it's changing culture, and it's changing the way um, the the what we're offering as higher education to really be that, you know, like we continue to hone in on, on what is our deliverable to our students. Um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for the very insightful conversation. We also want to extend our gratitude to the audience for attending this robust discussion that will hopefully serve many incarcerated and justice impacted students and communities. Thank you all for taking the time to join us today and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day.